Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Your Excellencies, members of Congress, ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention for a moment if I could just quiet down the hall? I'm delighted to be with all of you tonight as we salute the recipients of the Atlantic Council's Distinguished Leadership Awards. Each year, we recognize a select few who represent the best pillars of our transatlantic relationship, whether as political or policy leaders, business executives, military officers, or artistic and humanitarian champions. What they have in common is that each honoree has made an indelible impact on our world, both in their personal and professional accomplishments and in their vision for creating a better future with our friends and allies. Tonight, as chairman of the Atlanta Council, it's a privilege to be able to say that for the first time in the Council's history, we're recognizing a group of all women honorees. And we're calling attention to the rising role of women's leadership in shaping a better world. Now, of course, as we gather to celebrate, we do so at a time when such leadership has seldom, if ever, been as crucial as it is today. And while just last week the Director General of the World Health Organization declared that COVID-19 was over as a global public health emergency, new challenges continue to emerge a year to the day since we awarded the people of Ukraine a special Distinguished Leadership Award, the war in the Ukraine rages on, shaping a new era of global competition, exposing fragility in international trade ties and furthering geopolitical uncertainty. It is innocent people who pay the price for war. Their suffering must not be forgotten. What's more, what's more, with the souring of the U.S.-China relationship, increased tensions and potential systemic threat to world order, the post-World War II sense of stability has never been more threatened. The task now before the Atlantic Council is not just to diagnose the geopolitical moment, in which we find ourselves, but also to inspire the United States and its partners to enhance their collective efforts to shape a better, more prosperous world. As an Atlantic Council community, we can be encouraged by how our organization is rising to the moment. We have provided action-oriented solutions for protecting Ukraine's sovereignty and freedom, and we have made clear why this war and the U.S.-China rivalry are struggles over what forces, principles, and practice will determine our global future. As we recognize each honoree at this evening's historic all-female lineup, we do so in an era increasingly in search of a role models for women and girls. So tonight, we celebrate not just what each of these extraordinary women have done, individually to shape our global future, but what they have done collectively for other women to ensure a better future. So in considering my remarks this evening and where words can sometimes fall short of the physical and the visual expression in terms of rising to the moment, I was transported to an exhibit that was unveiled a few years ago at the Venice Biennial by a Nigerian artist, Peju Ulatesha. She's a Nigerian artist, poet, and writer. You'll see her exhibition here. Now, in her cultural and sculptural inst installation, Flying Girls, she has called for a more just future for girls and imbued the girls with an immense transformative ethos and power in her moving exhibit. We see a striking collection of eight life-size figures of girls united in a circle, adorned with wings and surrounded by birds, 
and butterflies shaping a pattern that appears to be a murmuration. That's a large group of birds that all fly together and then they change direction together. You've seen this when you look up at the skies as birds switch their line and move. Notably, the butterflies are seen surrounding the figures on the ground, suggesting a metamorphosis as they emerge from their cocoons and prepare to take their first flight. And we seem to be witnessing a powerful collective transformation of sorts coming from within these girls and future women, preparing them for their first flight with a momentum from the ground up, using this artistic expression to guide the future. The artist, she transports us to a future where identity is shaped rather than predetermined. This is the same transformation that we are witnessing here tonight, a movement embracing and driven by women and girls globally. In Flying Girls, the murmuration is a winding upward spiral, not only enveloping the girls, but also empowering them. The shape is especially significant as the pass of women in leadership roles itself, because those have never been linear. A befitting segue to the personal and professional stories of our honorees this evening. So for tonight's distinguished leaders, it's not just how far they have traveled, but the way they have traveled along their past. Not weighted down by obstacles or cynicism about what's possible, instead buoyed by a single-minded resolve in their vision for what the future can be. One of our honorees, the Honorable Avril Haynes, whom we are awarding the Distinguished International Leadership Award, is the U.S. Director of the National Intelligence. She is the first woman in our nation's history to lead the U.S. intelligence community. And given Director Haynes, <laughs> and given Director Haynes significant national security experience obtained through her service in all three branches of government and commitment to building a more resilient, inclusive nation through innovative intelligence, few are more deserving of our recognition. Avril grew up in an apartment in Manhattan's Upper West Side. Her father a biochemist, her mother was a painter. And her mother became seriously ill when she was 12 years old. And still a child herself, she spent four years as her mother's principal caregiver, up until the moment of her passing. Left without her own mother as a role model, a younger Avril did not let her grief defeat her. She gathered her strength, she changed directions, and she deferred college for a gap year. She went to study Japanese martial art judo at Tokyo's Kodokan Institute, where she achieved an incredible feat, rising to a brown belt in just one year. Later, as a student of theoretical physics, Avril pursued a dream project of restoring a secondhand plane and flying it into Europe. With her flight instructor, she found a 1961 Cessna, and she rebuilt the navigation, communication, and other electronic systems. And not long into their flight, however, they had an emergency landing. But one upside to the failed adventure at that point was that they, but Avril found a lifelong travel companion in her flight instructor, whom she is married to today. Our next honoree, Dr. Nagonzi, Nagonzi Okonjo Iwala, whom we are awarding the Distinguished International Leadership Award, is the Director General of the World Trade Organization. She is the first woman to serve in that capacity, the first African in history to serve in that role. Her more than 30 years Her more than 30 years of public service includes a remarkable career at the World Bank and serving as finance minister of Nigeria, where she navigated intense personal and institutional challenges to implement far-reaching economic reforms. I can say on a personal note, when we started at Goldman Sachs our 10,000 women's program, it was Ngozi who herself said to us that we don't have a program, we have a movement. And for the last 15 years, 
Her idea has impacted our work on behalf of women and girls across the world. She was born in the Delta State in Nigeria, where her father was the Obi, or king, of the Obi royal family, which makes her a princess. Now, our cultures often assign a narrative that portrays women waiting for a prince to bring some kind of glass slipper to decide if they are fit. Well, she rewrote this, if not demolished that narrative for herself and future girls. She did not wait for a glass slipper. Instead, she shattered the glass ceiling. And along the way, she made sure to create the same opportunities for all girls, especially those who do not come from a royal background, to have this path of economic empowerment. Our third honoree, Adina Friedman, whom we are awarding the Distinguished Business Leadership Award. She's the chair and CEO of NASDAQ. Adina went from working as an intern at NASDAQ to making history as the first woman to lead a global exchange. However, this path, this path from intern to CEO was not a straight line. And after 18 years of working at NASDAQ, she left to join the distinguished Carlyle Group. She became the chief financial officer and managing director and played an integral role in taking the company public during her time there. She returned to NASDAQ. Three years later, served as its president and chief operating officer, and then she was named the CEO in 2017. And now she serves as chair and chief executive. And as a student, Adina, she was educated at an all-girls private school. And given the stereotypes at the time, she didn't see herself on a path to finance. After watching Sally Ride become her first American woman to go into space, she dreamt of flying high into space and becoming an astronaut. But closer to home, she found a role model in her own mother, originally a stay-at-home mom. Her mother later followed her own calling and went to get her law degree and became the first woman named at her law firm. Later in life as a mother herself, Adina had a similar moment awakening, and after years of taking her two sons and husband to martial arts classes, she decided to follow her interest and pursue classes herself. And similar to, uh, to all of our other panelists, but particularly to Avril, Adina rose to a black belt in Korea Taekwondo which she now credits for helping her become more fearless in business. And fearless she is. And I can tell you firsthand she's quite fearless. And tonight's fourth honoree, General Laura Richardson, whom we are awarding the Distinguished Military Leadership Award. She's the commander of the U.S. Southern Command. And General Richardson became the first woman Army officer to officially hold the position of Deputy Commanding General of Forces Command, and the only second time that a woman four-star has laid a combat command. With more than 30-year storied career in the United States Army, her command is the largest in the U.S. Army, responsible for training and preparing active, reserve, and National Guard troops to meet the requirement of commanders around the globe. And as a student, Laura was an all-American swimmer. swimmer. Her path in life is seeing her thrive on land and on sea and in the air. Because when we talk about flying girls, General Richardson got her pilot's license at the young age of 16, a literally flying girl, joining, I suppose, her co-pilot here tonight, Avril Haynes. So between the martial arts and the air travel, we see some common central themes emerging, if not symbolic of the empowerment and the uplifting of all women and girls. And then finally, ladies and gentlemen, tonight we pay special tribute to the women and the girls of Iran. We are awarding the Distinguished Humanitarian Leadership Award by honoring a delegation of Iranian female activists. The tragic death of a 22-year-old, Masha Gina Amini, 
in the custody of Iran's so-called morality police has brought the Islamic Republic of Iran's gender discriminatory laws into clear focus, and the subsequent women-led uprising has stirred the international community. It's a privilege to recognize the vast efforts of the activists who will accept this award this evening. Dr. Mahnaz Afangani, the former Iranian Minister of Women's Affairs and President and CEO of the Women's Learning Partnership, who unfortunately herself fell ill and couldn't be with us tonight. Azam Jangravi, one of the girls of the revolutionary street who was arrested for protesting against Iran's laws requiring women to wear a hijab in public. Dr. Maraji's Kar, Iran's women's rights lawyer and writer, and Nazim Noor, Iran in actress, writer, and activist. The bravery of Iranian women and girls in risking their safety to achieve change is unquestionable. And together, this delegation's advocacy utilization of their public platforms to raise awareness of the circumstances in Iran has been crucial to accountability efforts. In their honor, I wanted to offer just a closing piece, a closing art piece, intentionally using a double entendre on the word peace as the artistic expression is meant as a global peace offering. The picture that you see here is by an Iranian artist, Shireen Neshat, as part of a collection of black and white photographs of women symbolizing Iranian women's involvement in efforts to improve women's education, increase representation in government, securing new legal rights, and expanding their economic opportunities. In this particular detail, the women's hand, its gesture, suggests prayer. And the handwritten calligraphy on the edge of her white veil translates from Farsi, give a hand so I can hold a hand. Now this message, give a hand so I can hold a hand, conveys a peaceful and powerful message of unity that symbolizes tonight's event, its theme, and all of our women honorees. It calls out to our global community, especially poignant in this pandemic recovery era, to reconnect our hands, literally and figuratively. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for all being here to celebrate these remarkable women, on behalf of the Atlanta Council, our co-chairs for this evening, I just want to take this moment to offer our hands in celebration of their honors. Thank you. I now direct your attention to the screen for a look at our first honoree.